I'm now proceeding with Exodus chapter 3 and verses 13 through 15. And what I would like to do with this message is to identify just a few examples in Scripture where memorials are identified and for their purpose. And as I look for memorials in Scripture, the first memorial I come to is in Exodus 3 verses 13 to 15. God is in dialogue with Moses, and his circumstance is that of the burning bush. As God is commissioning Moses to go into the service of bringing forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And in Exodus 3, verse 13, Moses is communicating to God and saying, Behold, when I come into the children of Israel and shall say to them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. The first memorial that we find in the scriptures, in the word of God, is God establishing himself as the eternal self-existent one and identifying himself with the name I am. This first memorial is the name of God himself. As we read in John 8, 58, when Jesus was addressing his disciples <coughs> and the Pharisees, and he was saying, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus himself, identifying himself with this memorial that God has established, to identify the very God himself. We have in the memorial name of God a reminder of his presence. Then I turn to Exodus chapter 12 where I found the second reference to a memorial in scripture. According to the search criteria that I used, this is what I came up with, you may find other memorials not so specifically identified. But in Exodus chapter 12, and beginning with verse 12, God is speaking, saying, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now here our context is that of the preparation for the Passover, the preparation of the nation of Israel in their finally being led out of the bondage in Egypt. Verse 13. The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. The first instituted memorial day by God himself, for the nation of Israel. Ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. 
This is, of course, the Memorial Day of the Jews, of the nation of Israel, as they were celebrating the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread that took the seven days following. This Memorial Day was the Jewish Passover, and this is a memorial to remember God's deliverance. The picture of God's deliverance is that of recognizing the blood of the sacrifice and passing over that home as judgment was brought upon the Egyptians. And we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 our own recollection of this given to us as a church, the ordinance of the Lord's table as a memorial of God's deliverance through the blood that was shed by his Son, Jesus Christ, available to all who would call upon him for salvation. I will turn next to Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2 gets into the sacrifices that were being offered, and I wanted to highlight one thing in the first two verses of Leviticus chapter 2. In chapter 1 you have the law of the burnt offerings, and in chapter 2 you have now the law of the meat offerings. And God is giving the ordination of this offering this way. When any will offer a meat offering, that is a grain or meal offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. <clears throat> and he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof and of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Here we have a memorial portion of the grain offering, of the meat offering. It is interesting to recognize how these offerings, beginning with the burnt offering and then other offerings, including the fellowship offering, etc., the system of these offerings was intended to be that which would sustain and feed the priests of the temple, of the priests of the, the tabernacle, the priests of the tent of meeting in the Old Testament. But these sacrifices were the bread and butter, so to speak. That being a, a pun to reference Specifically, that meal, the meals, the meats that the priests would be participating of. So as they would sit down to meet, as we would put it, they had the built into that particular offering a memorial portion that was taken out and burned on the fire that was burning the burnt offering, which was the base of all of their offerings. That memorial portion of the meat offering was there to remind the worshipers with every offering that they weren't just fellowshipping with the priests. They were fellowshipping with God himself. This memorial portion of the meat offering was a reminder of God's fellowship. There are many other memorials that were established in the Old Testament. I then came to the New Testament and found in the New Testament a couple references to memorials. One is in Matthew 26. It's an interesting memorial that I want to highlight. Matthew chapter 26 and verses 12 and 13. Matthew 26, beginning 
with, well, we'll begin with verse 6. Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. There came unto him a woman with an alabaster box of very precious ointment, poured it on his head as he sat at me. But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said to them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. And then, in verse 13 of Matthew 26, we have this reference to the memorial. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached, the gospel being the news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, which they would eventually come to understand as his disciples. This gospel, wheresoever it is preached, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Now it is appropriate in this case that we do not specifically understand who the specific woman was that did this anointing. The memorial is not to highlight the individual, but to highlight the action of faith. Recognizing her own sin and recognizing that this man, Jesus, was the one who would take away sin. And in her expression of love and faith, in his being able to address her sin situation, she was anointing his body for burial, as Jesus described it. This preparation of Jesus' body for burial is a memorial of this woman's faith in God's Son to bear our sin. And then finally, I would like to highlight one more memorial that's identified in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10. We have a peculiar memorial being addressed here in Acts chapter 10. Just reading the first four verses, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, it was obvious, it was about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God, it was the ninth hour of the day, pardon my improper emphasis. In the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him and addressing Cornelius by name, and here is the reference to the memorial in verse 4. When he looked on him, he was afraid. He said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now we understand from the book of Hebrews that the true tabernacle in heaven has the altar of incense standing there before the veil that leads into the Holy of Holies. And it is on that altar of incense that the prayers of the saints, that is, of yours and mine, as we pray to our Heavenly Father, those prayers in heaven are the incense rising from that altar before God's throne. And here, the angel of the Lord saying to Cornelius, thy prayers and thine alms are come up before God as a memorial. Now the concept of its being considered a memorial is something that I 
looked at and I said, well, now there is a new way of remembering, of recognizing our prayers before God. Our prayers are a memorial before God, a memorial for God himself, as if God needs to be reminded to think about us. Certainly, God does not need to be reminded to think about his people whom he has chosen, whom he has drawn, and whom he has redeemed by the blood of his Son. God's attention to his children does not need a memorial. But we understand, from our perspective, our prayers are there as a memorial, as if we should understand that when we pray, God's attention is drawn to our circumstances. Our prayers go up as a memorial before God. God's reciprocal attention to the prayers of his people. That is the memorial that we see in Acts chapter 10. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for our freedom. Freedom from the penalty and the punishment of our sin. We had a spoken testimony about the example of suffering that the Marines have had to go through. And as extreme as that may be, and not to belittle what our service members have done, yet Jesus Christ himself gave us the example of the supreme suffering, not just the suffering that leads to death, but the suffering that allows a human body that is so mutilated by the treatment that it received and continued to live. That is a more extreme and supreme suffering that Jesus Christ offers for us to recognize. That is part of his suffering and part of his paying the penalty for our sin. We deserve that. Many of our service men have accepted the challenge and the willingness of suffering the risk or the risk of that suffering for the sake of serving our country and obtaining our freedom. How much greater our Savior Jesus Christ paid for our sinful condition to redeem us from our lost condition. Indeed, without Jesus Christ, we are in an ongoing conflict against God. There are some conflicts that are still going on out there with our U.S. service members and of other countries around the world. These are called ongoing conflicts. They have not been closed in the books. They are still out there. They are still counting. But without Jesus Christ, we are in an ongoing conflict against God, as if God were our enemy. Only we are guaranteed to lose. In this conflict, we must surrender to the enemy, only to realize that his great love in freeing us from our bondage to sin and welcoming us into the fellowship of his Son is not the enemy, but he is freeing us from the enemy, which is Satan, who does not want us to have that fellowship with God and through his Son, Jesus Christ. We have this to our reminder. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here I would invite 
our trumpeteer to come back and be prepared for the conclusion of our service this morning. Satan does not want us to fellowship with the Son of God, with God himself. But God wants to free us from that. And by recognizing what Jesus Christ did in the example, his example of supreme suffering and his paying the penalty for our sin upon the cross, that is how we can recognize and come into fellowship with his Son. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In reference to a moment of silence, I have understood that it is unconstitutional to invite a moment of silence unless it is a neutral invitation. Therefore, I have prepared a neutral invitation to a moment of silence that does not invite anyone to call upon any religion that they are not comfortable with calling upon. But before I issue that, let me say this. If ever we needed a moment to remember and thank God for those who sacrificed their lives to obtain and to retain our freedom, now is the time. If ever we needed a moment to offer up to God our prayers for God's continuing protection upon those who are still serving our country, now is the time. Amen. If ever we needed a moment to call upon the name of the Lord to free us from our bondage to sin and to welcome us into his family if we have not already done so. Now is the time. Amen. We will now observe a moment of silence. At the conclusion of the playing of taps, we will be dismissed. Please stand. We will take 60 seconds as a moment of silence. And then I will nod and our trumpeteer will play. 